All right, my apologies. I'm going to have to find a workaround if we end up having to do this for any length of time. Um, so back to where we were with this particular poem. Again, this is a poem that has to do with... Um, with a woman who is sort of victimized in her marriage. And I think most of you who read this poem understood that particular issue. Um, so notice that the thing about, you've got a juxtaposition here, and Jennifer's Tigers prance across the uh, screen. Look at the verbs here. Prance is sort of this idea full of pride and full of kind of dignity. And instead, you've got Aunt Jennifer's finger fluttering. Um, and so that's, you know, this sort of light, nervous, in this case, nervous almost energy. Um, bright topaz denizens in a world of green. So you've got topaz, which is, is a jewel tone. It's not just orange. It's jewel tone orange, right? So this is something of value. And they're denizens. They're not just inhabitants. They're denizens. They, they belong there in a world of green. And, of course, green is growth and life, and that's the sort of the symbolism of those colors. They do not fear the men beneath the tree. Now, we know in contrast Aunt Jennifer has terrified hands. Even when she's dead, her terrified hands will lie still ringed with ordeals she was mastered by, things that she went through because of, and this ties back to these lines right here, the massive weight of uncle's wedding band. And so we know that there's something very wrong in this relationship. Now the speaker here again is a relative of Aunt Jennifer's. Um, it's someone who is um, has seen up close what she's been through. Um, they pace in sleek chivalric certainty. So in many ways, Aunt Jennifer is creating a world with this tapestry that she's sewing. Um, the ivory needle hard to pull, the wool, the massive weight sits heavily. And we know that she's creating a world that she does not inhabit. It's almost like in contrast to the world that she's living with, with her, um, her husband, um, She's got this this sort of unrealized life that are that is symbolized by these tigers. And tigers are, are like pretty much top of the food chain. They are proud. They are um, kind of masters of their domain, if you will. Um, and so that's what this poem is about. It's a poem of contrast. OK, uh, I don't necessarily think that was maybe hard to understand. Um, Those Winter Sundays as well is a poem about relationships, about the relationship of a son looking back as he's older on his father, whom he never really understood and never understood um, that what he was doing was actually um, a form of love. Um, I, this poem reminds me of this idea of love languages, of uh, if you've ever heard of that idea that there are five different kinds of love languages. Some people interpret love through what people say to them, some by how they, if people spend time with them or the love interest, some by physical affection, some by acts of service, and some by, um, I think it's words of affection, gifts, gifts. And in this case, this father, um, the only way he knows to show affection is basically through his service to his family. Now notice Sunday is considered a day of rest, and notice that we, we know right away, Sundays too, my father got up early. So in, in other words, the father never got a break, um, a day off. He put his clothes on and the blue-black, blue-black is trying to indicate how very cold this is. If something is so blue that it's black, it's almost like that black ice, if you think about that on the road. Um, that's absolutely cold, and then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather. So we know this is a, a man who worked outside, um, this father, that he worked with his hands, and that he um, basically then is in the cold, so cold that, you know, both the physical labor and the temperature is cracking his hands, but he's still making things warm for his family. Then notice this line, no one ever thanked him. Okay, so we get that first hint of this is this poem. The tone of this poem is very bittersweet. Um, it's it's uh, regretful. It's looking backward and wishing that um, the son had been able to see things differently. 
I'd wake and hear the cold splintering. If you've ever been in an old house on a cold morning before the heat kicks on, you know how the wood and the walls even seem to kind of crack and creak, and that's what it's talking about. Um, there's a lot of, of uh, cacophonous words, too, like breaking, blue, black, cold. All of those are harsh-sounding words to imitate the harshness of what's happened in this family. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. Now, this line lets us know that um, that basically um, there's a lot of fighting. There's a lot of, of irritation in this, in this family. Um, the, from the father's side, probably as much as the son, speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold. In other words, the, the boy just pretends like he doesn't care. Um, and we know it's a boy because the dad is... is um, polished his good Sunday shoes, and that probably doesn't happen, doesn't happen much anymore at all, but certainly doesn't happen with, with a daughter, right? And then here's the turn, what did I know? And notice that it's repeated. Anytime something is repeated, words or lines or phrases or sentences in a poem, it's there for emphasis. So it's almost that kind of that you get that sense of mourning. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? An office here means like a position that you hold. So this position in the family of this father at, who is doing these things for the family, um, austere, of course, means severe, a stripped down, um, void of anything flashy. Um, that's what the word there means. And so what you get here is the sense of a relationship, of mourning a relationship where the father went underappreciated um, because the boy didn't interpret what he did as love. Um, and that's pretty common. A, a lot of us may have relatives. This reminds me very much of my grandfather, who is a very harsh old guy, a farmer. But his way of, of loving his family was through the acts of service toward them. Okay. This next poem is not difficult to understand necessarily, but there's some key things I want to point out to you. And there are a couple of different interpretations. Yes, it is talking about love and friendship, and it uses these similes. Love is like a wild rose briar. Please notice the word wild here, because it symbolizes love is often... Um, Roses are often symbols of, of love, but notice that this is a wild rose briar. So it comes up suddenly, it grows, it's, it's sort of like this sort of flash. It's not cultivated, it's not tended, it's just there it is, right? Um, and friendship is like the holly tree. Both of them, notice, have their prickly parts to them. Holly can be prickly as well. Um, the holly is dark when the rose briar blooms. I notice the, the pattern here is, is one of questioning in the first two stanzas, but which will bloom most constantly? The speaker here is someone who's probably older, who's been through a lot or at least observed a lot and has some wisdom. And, and the movement of the poem, another part of the, another pattern that you could say is it moves through the season. So you talk about in the, in the spring and how beautiful this is, and then summer, you know, how it smells great. But yet when winter comes, and winter, of course, symbolizes here hard times. Think about the symbolism of the seasons that we talked about before. Who will call the wild briar fair? So when times get tough, does that passionate love that kind of came out of nowhere, maybe even, and this may, um, some of you kind of mentioned this in that um, AP versus um, Araby um, discussion board that I had you do. One of the similarities is both of these young boys are kind of confusing, um, confusing sort of physical desire for love. Um, you know, the, the unnamed boy in Araby is young. This is his first kind of uh, crush, if you will. And then the guy in uh, Sammy in AMP, we know is basically, you know, has these these this desire for, for Queenie especially. Um, and so that's almost what's being illustrated here is, is this mistaking something that really is not going to last um, for something that will. And... Notice the turn is with the word then, scorn the silly rose wreath now. And there's lots of alliteration in this. There are things we could say about that alliteration. But especially right here when December blights thy brow, that's cacophony. And the, the alliteration of those B sounds is almost like taking, giving a beating. You know, it's like hitting and blights thy brow with the, with the emphasis there. Notice that December is personified. So it means that when things get rough, when it gets really cold, 
here's this harshness. Um, the friendship, right? The evergreen is still, the holly tree is still green. There's still life in it. There's, it's still going on versus what happens to the silly rose wreath, okay? Um, so there are a couple of ways to interpret the, the theme here. One is that the, um, that friendship will outlast so don't dump your friends right for for some especially some quick love interest but, but it can also mean that a, a, a love relationship based on friendship will last longer can you see how you can kind of interpret it either way there okay all right, the last poem before we talk about um, briefly about the the short stories neutral tones by Thomas Hardy this is um, we're back to, whoops, not sure where it went. Hang on a second. Um, all right, unfortunately, it appears that um, I've kind of jumped ahead um, from where, where I was. Um, let me go back to love and friendship really quickly because um, I don't think it got this part. Again, I had a problem cutting out. Um, with this particular poem, notice that the movement again is, and I don't know where it stopped. Notice that the movement again is from um, is it's question answer, and then it's also through the seasons. And here's the the two sort of interpretations of this particular poem. It can be that this rapid love that grows up out of nowhere is is just a flash and it's going to and it's going to burn itself out and so by the time december of course being personified blights thy brow that is alliteration and it's and it's imitating kind of what um what was said before uh you know it's almost like a beating um that he may leave thy garland green and of course that means that the friendship is still fresh so the two interpretations are and i'm uh, i'm sorry if this if i'm repeating something that that you, it actually did record, um, but basically what it's trying to say here is that um, the um, that you know friendship will outlast these sort of quick, quick passionate romances or affairs, but it also can mean that love built on friendship will last when the when the you know honeymoon period for example is over that the love would still be um, fresh now switching back to neutral tones I don't think I picked up the first part that I said here again we have winter neutral it's devoid of color this is somebody looking back at the at the end of a relationship and it's devoid of feeling there's nothing um, there anymore that that the person feels in contrast to say the poem one art where somebody is looking at the end of a relationship and trying to get over it um, trying to not feel anything anymore this person doesn't feel anything anymore hence the neutral you know we it's got a lot of imagery in it we stood by a pond that winter symbolism of winter the end of things um, the sun was white the only time the sun is white is when um, you know it's it's covered by clouds and then the, this old-fashioned word chidden basically means as though God is angry at it so it's hiding its face a few leaves lay on the starving sod notice that this you know lack of being fed it's almost like a relationship that is has no emotion anymore they had fallen from an ash and were gray your eyes on me were as eyes that rove over tedious riddles of long ago in other words looking for something that, that's not there anymore and some words played between us to and fro on which lost the more by our love. In other words, there was just, there was nothing. There was nothing there. Um, these lines are so strong. The smile on your mouth was the deadest thing alive enough to have strength to die. In other words, can't even maintain that. Uh, and a grin of bitterness swept thereby like an ominous bird a wing. The whole idea of ominous, it's almost as though something's dying. Think of birds of prey. Um, so it, it keeps rehashing this idea that there's nothing. It's devoid of emotion, devoid of love, and a, almost devoid of life. Right, there's just nothing there. And then you've got this ellipsis, um, which means jumping forward in time. So there's stuff that's been left out. And here's your turn. Since then, we're currently in the present. Keen lessons that love's, here's what I've learned from this. 
that love deceives and rings with wrong have shaped to me your face. So in other words, this did not end well, and since then I've learned a lot from how this died. Your face and the God-cursed sun and a tree and a pond edged with grayish leaves. And so here's what's left, and there's not much to it, right? It's like all the emotion is drained out of it. So the person is not mourning anymore. It's almost, it's not quite bitter, although some of the language that almost creates a bitter tone here, but it's almost as though the person doesn't feel anything anymore. So what um, he or she, the narrator is, um, or persona who's speaking, um, actually feel, it, it, there's no feeling anymore. Um, so, Hopefully that's a little bit more understandable. Um, again, the only colors in this, neutral tones, you've got white, you've got gray. Um, there's just nothing to picture. There's no life here. All right, finally, a few words on the short stories. Um, one, uh, AMP and Araby, um, you know, I've given you some reading material that talks about how they're similar. Basically, and, and, and you've written a... Um, or most, or many of you have written a uh, discussion board that talks about their similarities and their differences. Um, and Araby is, is much older. It's based in Dublin, Ireland. Um, it's this boy. He's Catholic. He's on this sort of dead end street. Um, and essentially, it's kind of a coming of age story, both for him and for Sammy, an initiation story. The idea is that Sammy um, in AMP. It's not that Sammy probably hasn't had love interests or whatever before, but there's something about this girl or these girls that trigger in him this rebellion. Um, he's working at AMP. AMP is a dead end job for him. We know that because basically Sammy see, sees his friend Stokesy, who's just a little bit older than he is, who's already married, who already has two kids, whose hope is to be manager of the AMP, the grocery store someday. And, and, that's not a life that Sammy really wants for himself. And there's nothing wrong with being a manager of a grocery store, right? But, but Sammy, look at his attitude toward, uh, as he talks about the different patrons of the store, they're like cattle, they're like sheep, they're going through a chute, they all walk the same way, they all ask the same stupid questions. And that's the reason these girls, again, are juxtaposed, using that word, juxtaposition, against the shoppers because there's something unique and daring and different. And yeah, the girls are not dressed appropriately, and that's part of, you know, being young and part of being arrogant, too, because we also know that they're probably from a different class than most of the people shopping there. Their families are on vacation at a ritzy beach five miles away, and they're sent for pickled herring, right, which is, you know, at the time... Um, was considered a delicacy, and Sammy contrasts that with what his family would be, you know, serving little sausages and, and Schlitz beer, which is a pretty cheap beer. Um, and so Sammy knows the girls are out of his league, and that's basically what the, the, um, PowerPoint was talking about um, the whole idea of courtly love. It's this sort of modern retelling of the knight in shining armor. There's a point at which Sammy switches from those girls to my girls. He kind of almost takes ownership of them because he starts feeling sorry for them. It's one thing for him and Stokesy, and this is kind of how we know that he looks at Stokesy, and Stokesy's behaving the same way towards them that he is, and that disturbs him. I mean, that doesn't disturb him, but I mean, that's kind of like Sammy doesn't want to be that guy who's married with two kids and, and kind of making these comments about these girls. But then when um, you've got the the um, butcher who's basically behaving the same way, that's where Sammy starts. They become his girls. That he becomes protective of them. He actually, there's sort of a shift there. Now also notice that Sam, there's in that break, Sammy says, now here comes the sad part, although I don't think it's sad, but my parents do. So Sammy does not regret what he did. So don't misunderstand that. Sammy kind of took a stand for these girls. He stood up for them. It was probably a stupid thing to do. but um, And that's what Sammy learns at the end of the story, that that this this gesture that he's made, standing on principle, um, will cost you. And, and a lot of times, 
and somebody said this, I was just reading someone's discussion board about um, both boys make a sacrifice and they get nothing in return for it. And that's part of the reason that they learn something from the experience. The boy who's never named in um, an Araby, Araby, if I, Google it online, look Google Araby or Google Arab markets, look how colorful and flashy and, and exotic they are. So this bazaar was named Araby, but when the boy gets there, it's anything but. Again, we have that juxtaposition between reality and expectation. The boy thinks he's going to get one thing, right? This, this, the girl is exotic to him. He's young. We know the boy is about 13. So this is kind of his first crush on Mangan's sister. She's never named either. She's just Mangan's sister, right? So this is this boy's first crush. And the only language he has to describe it is, is religious language. He, he elevates her to this place. Again, it's that whole idea of chivalry. The girl, the woman on the pedestal, he elevates her to this place that's unrealistic. You know, she's barely, she speaks to him, what, maybe one time, pays attention to him. You notice that she's sort of twisting her bracelet around on her arm, so she's kind of flirting with him. And the whole idea there is, yeah, in some ways she does play him. You know, I can't make it to the market because I've got to go to this thing. And so the boy's going, oh, well, I'm going. And, and he absolutely decides he's going to buy her something there. And what happens, it's very subtle, but what happens in that story is when he hears, when he get, makes it to Araby just barely because of, you know, all the things that he has to go through with the uncle coming home late and, um, you know, and, and taking the last um, train out and, and that kind of thing. When the boy gets there, he overhears a shopkeeper, you know, most everything's closing. It's not the exotic, amazing place that he thinks it's going to be. It's just a bunch of people trying to earn some money. And it's, I mean, think about going to a flea market, right? Flea markets are not exotic, basically. They've got a lot of stuff and you kind of have to hunt through them to find what you want. And so the reality that the boy encounters at Araby mimics the reality that the boy basically has to face about this crush he has on Mangan's sister. There's nothing there. There's, you know, and, and the way he knows that is he hears this, this sort of flirtation between this shopkeeper and these two guys. And he realizes that, uh, he realizes it for the emptiness that it is, that all this, this energy and passion he's put toward this girl, he doesn't, she doesn't mean anything to him there, or he doesn't mean anything to her. There's just nothing there. And so that's kind of the idea of both of the Sammy and uh, the boy in Araby, their initiation into some kind of experience of a realization of, of, of making these sacrifices with no return. Okay. Um, finally, in yellow wallpaper, it's pretty straightforward. I think there's a lot of irony throughout the thing. Um, the fact that the woman is in a nursery, right, quote unquote, and, and, uh, and in many ways, yes, yeah, she is treated like a child. Um, the irony of the fact that the illness, uh, the cure for the illness actually makes her worse. The irony of the fact that her passion, she's not allowed to, to, um, to go outside, to be around people, to, to write, so she has to sneak and do it. And what happens is, you know, she is chronicling the fact that she's, going deeper and deeper into madness and you've got this woman in the yellow who's trapped in the yellow wallpaper and of course by the time that we get to the end of the story it is she who is trapped and this is a very old story um it definitely points to the idea of of women um in a, in a time where they really basically were trapped um, by marriages, by bad advice, by, um, by not having much power over their lives, and, um, and certainly by a misunderstanding of postpartum depression, which has only been recognized as a, as a, uh, a viable um, um, disorder or, or illness. Um, having to do with, you know, depression in, in the past roughly 20 years or less. Um, so I think that story is pretty straightforward. Uh, hopefully this is helpful. If you have any, I'm, again, I'm sorry, I'm going to, if if we do have to continue using this method, um, you know, of, of, of being at home and <laughs> and I can't get to my office, then I'm going to, I'm going to, 
find a better way to uh, set up future sessions because we'll have to have at least one more to discuss the research paper and then I will want to have one more review session with you before the final test. Uh, there will not be a comprehensive exam in this class. I just give three tests, one over each unit, There will, and then three papers, and the last one will be a research paper. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to, um, to email me.